Good evening. Uh, we're at Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Ben Birch, and uh, we're just recording our evening message. Uh, and again, we just look forward to continuing to do this as long as the coronavirus uh, has us away, actually, uh, from the church, away from our congregation. Uh, originally, I started preaching to empty pews, but uh, we have now moved to home, and we're at the uh, kitchen table. And so this evening, I want to concentrate uh, on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is a matter of urgency right now. Uh, so many, I believe, as myself also. Uh, we're praying more than ever. Uh, suddenly, there's a pandemic among us. Uh, we are praying for relatives. We're praying for friends, not only locally, but around the world. This has brought us, again, to a re new relationship or a better relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we have entered into that relationship, uh, when this is over, uh, personally, I pray that we will continue praying more, praying more diligently, praying more earnestly. But to take a look at this matter of prayer, I want to do one of the things that's probably the simplest thing in the Word of God, and that is going to the Lord's teaching on prayer, normally known as the Lord's Prayer. I want to take a look at that. I want to allow it to be an encouragement to us today. Let's take a look. What does the Word of God say? Uh, we are here uh, in Matthew chapter 6. So if you open your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to pick up in verse 7. It says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we enter in to this portion again of Scripture, God is so good. Uh, Jesus Christ instructs those who are around him and instructs us to this very day, what is prayer? When you can come and say, God, how do we pray? We can simply come here in other sections of the Word of God and be taught this matter of prayer. We come to prayer, again, in an expectant attitude. If we come not believing, an expectant attitude is an attitude of belief. I believe God's going to answer my prayer, and I have prepared my heart to receive God's answer, because many, many times God's answer is no or wait. There are many times that God answers our prayers as we ask them. But there are those other times, and God, God knows best. And so we have to rely on him. But we come with an expectant attitude, expecting God to answer, and preparing our hearts to receive that answer. Verse 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. When we come to God, we need to come expecting. Expecting the answer. And here it says, Be not ye therefore like unto them. And again, it's speaking of the heathen that were talked about just prior to this. Be not ye therefore like unto them, the unbelievers. For your father. See, they have a different father. The Bible and Jesus Christ, as a matter of fact, told the Pharisees, the Sadducees, year of your father, the devil. And so they have a different, unbelievers have a different father. And so here, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father, which he's speaking to believers here, your father God knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Isn't that great? That our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that our God, the Father in heaven, they already know my needs. So often, we want our wants taken care of. 
God only guarantees our needs. And so here we also learn that this matter of prayer, when I come before God, I come before him knowing that he already knows. He knows my needs. He will answer those needs. You say, you know, but I am really praying that none of my family gets sick during this time. And then someone in your family gets sick. We need to be prepared to say, God, you're always right. And God, you're always good. There are times on this earth I don't understand why God allows some things to happen or not allow other things to happen. But I do know this. God is good. God knows the beginning from the end, and I do not. God has known everything, and there has never been a time that he didn't know everything. And so I trust him. I place all those things, all those prayers into God's hands. And we turn those things over to him with full assurance that his answer is the right answer. Secondly, as we look here at verse 9, we need to come to him with a heart full of worship. This is God. This is the creator of the world. This is the creator of the universe. This is the God that so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is God that would that no man die in their sins and go to hell. He would that all men come to repentance. We need to come with a heart full of worship to this wonderful, glorious God that knows me. And he knows me personally. Verse 9 says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. If you're going to pray, pray like God this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Boy, we need to come recognizing God for who he is. Hallowed be thy name. Most holy be thy name. To the, the idea is there, there are none more holy. Hallowed be thy name. Holy be your name. We come before the God of the universe. And the God of the universe has asked us to come. He has told us to come boldly before the throne of grace. When we have needs, when we have requests, when we know that there is a need for supplication, we bring that before the throne of grace. God is good and he is always good. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Most holy God, I approach thee. We come before him again in humility, but also in expectation that God is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. We also, as we come in prayer, we come in agreement with God. Not argumentative, but in agreement. It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as in heaven. And so we come before him here in verse 10 and say, thy kingdom come. What do we do? We say, listen, we're not trying to build a kingdom here on earth. We are not looking to make earth a utopia as so many have over the centuries. They have come up with an idea, uh, a, a way that they believe that the world can reach utopia, that we can all live together in peace and harmony, that all things will work together, that no one will be hungry, that no one uh, will, will be without anything. All things will be supplied, and we're going to lift up and create a utopia on this earth. No, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We come before God realizing our inabilities and realizing our shortcomings. Thy kingdom come. But today, I, I do not want to live eternity under a kingdom of men. But I do want to live in eternity under the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. My, what, a, what an amazing thing that believers, that Christians 
can have in their lives. Uh, again, thy will be done in earth. How can that happen when the Christian, when the believer, is obedient to the word and the will of God? Within this life, we can fulfill the will of God by continuing in his word, walking with his son, being obedient to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, isn't that a wonderful knowledge? That the absolute will of God is done in heaven. It's done there already. Listen, when the devil, when Lucifer fell from heaven, when he decided that he believed that he could become God, and he drew a third of the angels to his plan and to his idea, and that third of angels were cast out of heaven, the two-thirds of the angels remained faithful to God, always faithful, and they are faithful to God to this very day. God's will is carried out in heaven by the angels. It is a wonderful knowledge because we too, when we leave this earth and ultimately end up in heaven with God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his will will be done. And we will be so happy about it. It will be a joy of the ages to walk in the will of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that means already done in heaven. And so again, we also see here in verse 11, it's a petitioning. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can have a petitioning. We can ask God to fulfill our needs. We can go before him. It says, give us this day our daily bread. And that's in verse 11. And so we can go before God and ask for things. It's supplication. I need supply. God would love to grant us that supply. And so as we see this, as we have this in our lives, give us this day our daily bread. Also, we see the matter of when we come before God, the matter of confession of our sin. God wants us to come before him and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here, God wants a confession. He wants us to admit that there's sin in my life. There are things that I need to get right in my life before God. I love God. I want to be right with God. I want to walk with God. But to do that, it says, I need to confess and forgive us our debts. My sin is a debt that I owe before God. I have offended the God of the universe. I owe a debt, and that debt needs to be paid, and that debt is paid when I confess my sins, when I repent, is the other word that we use, when I repent of my sins. It says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so there is also within the Lord's teaching on prayer, it isn't just that we expect God to answer, that we have a heart full of worship towards the God who will answer. We have agreement with God. May his will be done. We petition for our needs. Give us this day our daily bread and also that confession or repentance of our sins. And he is faithful to forgive us our sins. Also, in this same manner, there's deliverance from Satan's influence. Boy, don't you want that in your life? To where we have deliverance from the temptation of the devil himself. And it tells us here, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The idea, this isn't God leading me to be tempted to sin. Lead us not into temptation. It, it is God buffering that matter of temptation coming into my life. 
It is God giving us the strength through the indwelling Holy Spirit of God to overcome that temptation. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God wants us to be delivered. He wants us to be able to recognize sin for what it is. And, of course, we can do that when we know the Word of God, when we've studied the Word of God. And something comes up, and we say, wait a minute, that's wrong. I don't want that in my life. That's sin. And so we turn away. We are delivered from sin because of my knowledge of the Word of God and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's one of the beautiful things I've watched over the years. Somebody gets saved. They really don't know the Bible. And almost immediately, because when we are saved, when we're born again, we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And the Bible says that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. And so now having received that Holy Spirit of God, he now takes up abode, he lives within us, these new believers. Something pops up and they're just, that's wrong. They recognize immediately that's sin. Well, how do they do that? Because they've received the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. God illuminates them through the Holy Spirit to recognize sin's influence and Satan's influence on their lives. Lead us not into temptation. Buffer that temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to see clearly what sin is, where sin is trying to attack my life, and that I simply move away from that matter of sin. And then lastly, we look at the fact here in verse, uh, and we're going down here uh, to uh, verse 1 of Matthew 6. And it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And the reality, the, the wonder, again, of what we see within this word of God. God needs our praise and position. He needs our praise and position. When we praise God and we place him in proper position, that is when we have the most power with God, when we are the strongest because we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And again, verse 13. That end of that verse is just glorious. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. How long? How long will God keep this power? You know, we look at the nations of the world, the great nations of the world. And you look at the Greeks and you can look at the Romans, all those who came after, the, the United States, the Russians, the Chinese, all of them had a beginning and all have or will have an end. God's end of power is forever. For thine is the kingdom. Ultimately, there will be no other kingdom but God's kingdom. And the power, there is no greater power than God. And the glory, there is no one, no one thing more glorious than our God. And his glory forever. Not just a day, not just 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, but forever. We need to place God in his proper position. We need to give God the praise. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the Lord's teaching on prayer. Thank you for this time that we've had together this morning. I just thank you, Heavenly Father, that in this time of trial, in this time of temptation, and in, in this time of anxiety, that Heavenly Father, God, you have said, here is how we pray. And we just follow along with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, teaching and how we pray, and how we come close to the Father, and how we repent of our sins, and how we walk with Him, and how we glorify, ultimately, our God and Father. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you will do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you've listened to the message this morning, and I just want to encourage you, uh, please continue praying. 
If you haven't been praying, do that. We have a wonderful outline, again, right here in Matthew chapter 6. Look at that outline on prayer. Follow through with those prayers. Follow through with glorifying our wonderful God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. You may be listening to this today and say, you know what, I, uh, I'm not saved. I don't have that kind of relationship. I don't have that prayer relationship with God because I'm not his child. The word of God is very clear. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What that teaches us is there is a way of salvation. And the word of God teaches it very, very clearly. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is this manner of believing. Those who believe in him. Belief is faith. You believe, you place your faith in Jesus Christ. Just like Romans 10.9 tells us, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It is that matter <clears throat> of placing faith in the right place. And that's in Jesus Christ. It's very simple. Prayer is simply talking to God. We, again, repent of our sins. We ask God to please forgive us our sins. Repentance means a change of mind. Well, it's 180 degrees. We were going away from God. Now we turn around and we go towards God. We repent of our sins. And we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, please, in prayer, do that today. Heavenly Father God, give these folks wisdom, give them direction. And Heavenly Father God, we know as the Holy Spirit convicts their hearts that he also can lead them unto salvation in Jesus Christ. We leave this in your hands. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.